I believe in you, you eat what you kill, right? Like you are incentivized to grow the pie that you've been given. That percentage is negotiable, right? You can't have a, a projection. You can't have like a percentage to spend bonus towards your buyers or your growth team. And it actually ruins your margins. Welcome Modern Commerce subscribers back at you again. Casey and John here with a surprise guest as well. We'll get to that in just a minute. John, how's it going, dude? Going well, my guy. Yeah, I'm excited about today's guest. Uh, somebody very near and dear to me. Uh, uh, Mr. Nick Shackelford, the not godfather of Facebook advertising, but like definitely like, you know, maybe the, the second in line to the godfather throne. I don't know. Uh, some, some, Nick, some would say. Some would say, you know. Uh, so Nick, you've got, you, you, I'm going to, you know, ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself, but you also have a big announcement. So hit us with your announcement. I already know what it is, obviously. Yeah, uh, and then tell us, a little, tell us a little bit about your background so everybody knows kind of what we're talking about today. Absolutely, man. I First of all, this is, this is exciting. I am the number one subscriber and the number one fan of this. I've watched every single episode today and I'm excited about this one. Um, but you kind of briefly led me into it. So my name is Nick Shackleford and the news that I'm most excited about is that we have come to an agreement with John and Casey's agency of explosive growth marketing, and they have been acquired as of two days ago. So yes. this has been, it's been a long time coming. It's something that I knew was important to us because John for us, at least on the structured agency where we're about 65 people strong, we have paid social email, SMS content, man, you name it. We, we, we pretty much got it going on over here, but we were missing like a lead. Like we're missing like a strong lead on our most important department. And he had great people with him. So this is what happened. Uh, John finally agreed to, to what we have and, and all of his people agreed to it as well. So I'm excited to, to have you part of the structured family, man. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm excited to be in it as well. I, uh, yeah, like we've actually been working together for like over a year already. So it's like, it's kind of a interesting acquisition, but it's going to be a good time. So yeah, I mean, tell us, we're, we're going to, sure. we're not talking about that the whole episode. We're going to talk about some other fun stuff, no. uh, but yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about bu building media buying teams and, uh, and building marketing teams. What do brands need to do? What do, what can they outsource? But give us a little background on you. So people like, you know, who don't know you already can understand uh, where you're coming from on this. Appreciate that. Yeah. So we, we have a lot of cover today, so I know I won't spend too much time on just the personal background, but we, <clears throat> I started the marketing shenanigans about seven years ago. I was a failed professional soccer player that did end up playing for the LA galaxy. Um, then I realized I was like, Oh, I'm a six foot, uh, short white guy and America loves tall giant white guys in all their sports areas. And I figured if I'm going to have any sort of career, any goals that I really set to myself, Probably shouldn't have chose soccer. Probably should have done baseball, football, hockey, anything else. Maybe basketball. Um, and I quickly realized that, like, I have a I have a good enough skill. And what my coaches all told me was, "You're a great locker room guy, Shaq. You're a good locker room guy. Uh, you know how to talk." I was like, "Awesome!" So I transitioned that quickly into the only other skill that I realized I, I had was digital marketing. Um, and so from the digital marketing side of things, we've been selling things along ever since, like magnetic eyelashes to, to fidget spinners to electric light bulbs to Man, you name it. I'm looking at a whole list of things, you know, teeth whitening, uh, face masks, goalie gloves, you name it. We, we, we've slung it on the internet. And now where we're at today is, John, we have a, we have a massive team of about 60, 65 people um, all around the world doing different things in the direct-to-consumer space. Um, and we are not slowing down. And the, these topics that we're talking about today is something that is very dear, uh, near and dear to my heart because... In our world, I, I truly believe like as an agency or just like marketers in general, we empower a lot of different things around us, right? We allow manufacturers and 3PLs to have business to service direct-to-consumer brands. We allow customer service reps to have opportunities or jobs as they service direct-to-consumer brands as those grow. So this agency hub is something that's extremely important for me to, to know, especially in what has happened recently with the pandemic and COVID and having others have opportunities to continue to A, provide for themselves, provide for their families and to impact other brands, like that's entrepreneurship, right? Like entrepreneurship is going to be driving a lot of this progression forward. So today it's not just a matter of like the agency world and not just a matter of marketing in general. It's a matter of how do we continue to make sure people are stimulating the economy and prepared to do so in the correct way? Because a lot of people are either oversold or they don't know, so they're preyed upon. And I hope that at the end of this, when you guys have a clear idea of what partners you need, uh, what's the right way of structuring that deal with those partners 
And should you do it yourself? Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, it's the tough thing, right. For a brand owner, for freelancer or whatever. And uh, yeah, I think that that's awesome. I want to get it in it. My, I think the thing you left out, you've sold a lot of stuff on the internet, but the, my favorite thing that you've sold is like fidget. I don't think fidget spinners were actually a thing before Nick Shackelford decided he wanted to sell fidget spinners on the internet. You this like, was, st- you like started a countrywide craze. Yeah. I, I, I called it the modern day yo-yo. <laughs> like we were, we, Jake and I were, Jake, uh, my other partner in this, he, he was the one who was like, dude, I think this is going to go off. I'm like, what is this? Like <laughs> what it's three, technically four bearings on a skateboard wrapped around a, a thing of plastic. And I was like, nah, this is not nothing fine. That all of a sudden we hit the right influencers. We started running Facebook marketing. We had the margins and it was the perfect storm of what all, whether you're a drop shipper or just a brand owner, it was the right product market fit. And we had the right angles to sell because at the end of the day, we were selling to parents for peace of mind so that their children were able to kind of like keep themselves busy. Yeah. And so you 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 were, it was a perfect, perfect scenario right before school was about to come back in. So some of the people had it because of summer. And then as soon as school went in at the time, what was it? 2017, 2016, it was wildfire, organic yeah, yeah. growth. I loved it. Yeah. And, and, and you actually ended up selling into Best Buy and exiting, right? Like so we had a we had a very great partner. His name is Justin. Justin was able to get us into big box. So the the main place we went into was Best Buy. We had contracts that would target. What we did wrong was something that I didn't. I was not smart of. I didn't have the business chops to to understand what was happening because we gave up too much decision power on the equity table on the cap table uh, to to really steer the direction. We we wanted to stay digital the entire time, but the partner at the time wanted to take us into big box. Which sure that it is what it is. But we didn't really have anything defensible. What we had was great branding around a product that everybody else was selling. Everybody was selling fidget spinners. We were selling fidget leaves, right? So it's like the core of what happens when you do something correctly and brand it, you kind of stand out, which got us the uh, opportunity to big box, but it wasn't different. Well, we tried to create a connected device. No one's ever said they needed a connected fidget spinner device in the world. And they they will never say that. (laughs) So that, that's the, not many people know that part, but when we try to launch a connected device into it, everybody looked at us going like, no, we don't need this dude. Like nobody <laughs> needs this guy. Like, what are you doing? So we, yeah. that was, I, I kindly, I kindly made the exit and I actually went back into the, the core that I currently have. The core skill that I currently love and have is selling things, right? Like I didn't want to do product. I didn't want to do research. I didn't want to do anything other than how do I position a product and get it into as many hands as possible? Yeah. And, and so, and really the reason I brought that up is because of what we're discussing today. And that is like, we're going to discuss things, you know, from brand owners, the e-commerce brand owners perspectives. We're going to discuss things from just pure marketers perspectives, from yep. agencies perspectives. And I think a lot of times these discussions on podcasts or on whatever, you know, guru YouTube videos or whatever, end up just being like sort of a pitch fest for what you are selling. Like, of course we have an agency, you know, and, and we want to work with great brands in our agency. But the reason I said that is because like you have scaled a brand like really yep. big and been the brand owner for it you have DIY media bot in that and done the DIY marketing. You've also like come in to brands for like shortish to longish term projects, like six months, 12 months. I know you were part of rise supplements, right. On on its launch. So it's like, you've been in house, you know, where you're an in-house marketer, you've been a brand owner and scaler yourself. Um, Your partner owns e-commerce brands himself Yep. You've been an agency person. So it's like, you've been on all sides of this. And I, I love your perspective on like, what should you hire? What shouldn't you hire? What, you know, what, what do you, and how do you teach these people? How do you find these people? So let me jump right into kind of my first question. And that is right now in our iOS 14 environment, post iOS apocalypse uh, environment where, you know, data is poor and nobody really knows what their ad accounts are saying and stuff like that are we moving into one of the things I'm hearing is like, are we moving into an era where media buying, you know, specifically Facebook ad buying, Google ad buying, digital media buying is a agency's only type of role because these are the people who are going to have the tools to deal with this, that are thinking about this all the time that have the partners, you know, the high level partners uh, at these platforms. So it's like a lot of agencies are sort of beating this drum where like, well, now you need an agency to do yeah. what you could have done yourself before, because, you know, we have all of these resources to help with this environment. Is this true? You know, what, what is your thought on this? The deep one, dude, it's a, it's a, it's a good question because on one hand of it, we have a, we have a, a low level like offer for people that are just starting, right. They can buy something more and they kind of be get guided along how to do this. And they don't have the cash flow to, to spend five, 
8, 10, 15K on a, a full service agency, yet they may or may not have the time to actually sit down, learn their data, learn the processes, get the systems, get the, get the software needed to do it themselves because they have to deal with all the other things that a brand owner has to deal with, right? Product hiring, customer service, fulfillment, content, right? So when I, when I see, I, I used to believe that everybody could do it themselves. I really, really did. And I think Facebook made it really easy. Facebook specifically made it very easy for businesses and brands to be built in a time where they didn't necessarily have to work too hard. Lot it up, the rise of the dropship, right? The deception that Facebook was for a lot of people as, as like a, Kind of like early Amazon days where you can kind of just like spin things up and it just hits an algorithm and it kind of works. Like we, we made a lot of businesses and I know businesses firsthand that should not necessarily have been built, but because of the environment, the ecosystem and the ease of going live and scaling, it worked, whether it should have or shouldn't. Yeah. Nowadays, you do need someone giving you insights of like, how do you make decisions on um, lack of data, lack of clarity on the data? Before you didn't have that before you can make decisions with like, oh, I looked at the ad account. That's pretty true. I looked at my ch- my uh, Shopify net sales. That's true as well. Keep going, spend that money. And you could kind of be a little bit eyes closed or head in the sand and, and still make things work. Nowadays, I really don't believe that you can do it by yourself or at least not in some sort of educational group or at least not talking to some other founders that are in the same scenario that you are in. Yes, I, I, I agree. So like, um, that said, I'm going to say like, you know, there's a certain phase of business too, where it's, you, you really, it's, it's kind of irresponsible to be working with agencies that, you know, provide certain services. So like, I, I was actually speaking with a brand earlier this week and they're like not pre-revenue, but it's like, you know, basically they've, they've got just their two or 300 Instagram followers that follow them personally that are like their friends and family. And they post about their business and like some of those people buy and that's that where their sales are at. And it's like, you don't need a Facebook ads agency. Like that's, you know, Facebook ads, Google ads, paid traffic. That's just fuel for your fire, right? Like you don't even have a fire yet. So like, yeah, I think there's a certain point where you should DIY. And I think that it's actually smart for brand owners or, you know, in-house marketers, brand owners really even to like actually have some, some marketing knowledge, technical knowledge. Uh, they don't have to go deep. They don't have to be media buyers. Um, but to like actually kind of understand these platforms a little bit, because, you know, a lot of times what we get at the agency is like, okay, so can we get to like a $50 CPA? Okay, great. We can, and we're spending a thousand dollars a day. All right, let's go ahead and do uh, $10,000 a day and, and keep that $50 CPA. And it's like, no, like if you've ever bought media or done direct response paid media before, you know, that it just, you know, things don't just scale nice and cleanly like that. But sometimes brand owners end up making those projections, pitching those projections to investors or building financial models and hiring models off those projections. So yeah, I think it's good for brand owners to have some background and knowledge on this. But I agree with you that like, unless it's your core competency, so we do know some brand owners like this where their core competency, yeah, you know, some come to mind right away. Their core competency actually is marketing, media buying. So if it's your core competency, for example, if, if you and I were to launch an e-commerce brand, it would be our core competency. We would exactly we'd be outsourcing things like product sourcing and fulfillment and things like that, right? So yeah, I mean, never outsource your core competency. But if it's not, then yeah, early on you're going to be looking for you know someone to help you understand like how this really engine that drives your your business vehicle works. Because uh, if you're not an engine person, like you really shouldn't be driving that yourself. And you're absolutely right. Facebook has, has been a really great arbitrage opportunity for a few years and has allowed, like you said, a lot of businesses to build, be built that wouldn't have otherwise been built, which is, it's a hard thing to hear for some of the people who feel like they might be one of those businesses, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you on this. Casey, anything else you would add on top of that? Because I know you get to see a a good amount of brands um, and you, 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 you have a good perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a complicated question already, so it's got a complicated answer. Um, but you know, I think there's, I think we could dive deeper into it as far as like, it, it sounds like the answer might be yes, might be no, whether you can kind of do it on your own, right? Uh, but I wonder if within that scope, are there certain roles that you need to do yourself, or you need somebody absolutely to do for you, or that you need a certain type of person even to do? Right. Like, are there absolute in-house hires, absolute in-house roles in your sales marketing department for a DTC e-com brand? Yeah. 
Yeah. Thoughts on this, Nick? Dude. Yeah. Thank you for that's a good segue because a lot of the times we, a lot of times we'll go live and we're like, okay, who's our POC? Who's our point of contact on the other side? And how much, how much knowledge do they have about this space Mm -hmm. and how much education do we need to provide them? Or do, are they, are they more so like, Hey, we get it. I know how this ecosystem works. Let me know how I can be supportive of you. And that's, that's really my role on, on partnering with new brands coming into it. I had a great conversation with a a man named Jeff right before we jumped on the call. And he goes, he's already built a beautiful business, but he goes, I need that core team focused on this core business. I, I don't need to micromanage you. I don't need to ask specific questions. I need a good media buyer. I need a good creative person. And that's it, right? That's that's very hard to come by. And it kind of back on the first one where if the founder doesn't necessarily know how the, the buttons work, how the attribution works, how like a general baseline of knowledge works, they're going to get duped. There's going to be a person, a, a, a freelancer, an agency out there that's going to take advantage of the ignorance of what's happening. Yeah. And it's not, it, it's not, mal, it's not uh, malicious. It's just unfortunately how that industry is it's just how our industry is if you aren't in that right space or if you are hungry for a contract i'm probably going to say a couple things or make promises that aren't necessarily as true as you believe them to be or maybe they might feel like they're true but they might not be but they're exactly what you want to hear instead of that's not what exactly what what you need to be hearing but i would say like the the competency of media buying the the skill of media buying in Mood seas and in choppy seas is a skill that's very difficult to have in house. And here's here's my my honest answer on this: those that understand how to do this most likely are either extremely expensive or probably already doing it for themselves. And if they don't want to be doing on media buying, it's because they don't want to deal with like the HR. They don't want to deal with like the follow up, the billing, or or these other other areas that isn't in their core competency of sitting in the account, making decisions, and optimizing. Right. And they are expensive. We know because we hire them, right? So like <laughs> very expensive. They, 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 these are the people agencies hire and uh, an and in-house brand can almost never offer them the same thing as an agency can, right? So they can make the most freelancing or having their own agency, but then they have to deal with billing taxes, all this stuff, right? Um, yeah. and, and churn turnover of clients and all of that, right? Uh, doing their own business development. Or they go work at an agency, they can make the next most there because the agencies can like keep them in work and, and give them upsides and then or they could go to an in-house brand there's a certain point at which uh an in-house brand can offer them an attractive role like in and but it's i'm thinking of it i'm thinking of a brand right now that i know hires in-house media buyers and again this is if it's not your core cause there are some people you and i both know that are brand owners that it's like their original core competency was media buying and they're like Look, i build this whole thing on direct response offers right um but you know again we're gonna leave those aside because those people know who they are you know um there's a brand that like you know i'm thinking of right now they're here where i'm based out of it's ifit right like they own like nordic track and stuff like this yeah Yeah, they hire in-house media buyers because they're huge um you know and so the biggest actually problem i think with dtc brands for hiring in-house media buyers is that you actually you can't give them a lot of consistency or you as a DTC brand can't be confident that you're going to be able to like consistently keep paying them what they're worth. Right. Cool. Like we, we, we had a brand hire someone in house and my biggest worry for him was he was at kind of $5 million going to a $10 million run rate, which is great. He had great growth, but I'm like, dude, I mean, you got to be 40, 50, 60, $70 million run rate before you can be confident that you're always going to need that in houser, right? Yeah. You might get six, seven months down the road, get into choppy seas. It's not even their fault, but you're like, man, I can't afford to pay this person anymore. Or they're like, yo, I'm not ever hitting my bonus, you know, because things aren't going well. Uh, and so then they're like wanting more money and you're like, I already can't afford to pay you the money that I pay. Exactly. So, so I'm not saying it's like, you should never hire it in house. Uh, but I think the key hire, the key people that you actually need in brand are people who are really connectors, right? So they're able to like be the glue guy, right? Like be the person who connects your creative team, whether that's outsourced or in house to your media buying team connects the dots between your media buying team and your retention team, right? And all of those things could be outsourced, really, I think, those, all those ones that I just said, um, but you need the glue guy, right? And then you're the, or the glue girl uh, or, you know, and then your retail team, like that kind of glue person that's like, they have the full view. They know how to connect it all together. They know how to give those teams what they need 
in order for those teams to stay in their lane and do what they're really good at. That's what you need in-house and uh, knows the names of it. Like this is such a weird thing, but knows how to label what you need, right? Like yeah. okay, right now we're having this big struggle with data. Okay, like I know the label for what we need is you know, this, we need a first party attribution tool, right? Like that is, that's the person that's like really the valuable in-house hire is the person who can understand you really just give those people empower all of your different outsource teams or in-house teams. Some of these things could be in-house uh, to, to do what they're best at. Oh, the only, go on case. I think that's an important thing you're bringing up, John, because as we're talking about some agencies or some outside people might tell you the things you want to hear as opposed to what you need to hear that glue guy or that internal hire, I think there's a certain element of trust when somebody's kind of, you, you handpick them as opposed to this agency kind of finding you maybe. Right. And having that glue guy being able to control some of those things. I mean, in, in our experience even, I know there's sometimes I was put in a role in our agency that maybe I wasn't the best suited for, but there's an element of trust or I don't know, you're probably better at describing it than I am since you were the one who might've put me in that role, John, but uh, but yeah, I, I think that would help explain it for people in that position where they just kind of intuitively know they don't just want some stranger who kind of sold them a dream, kind of controlling every single facet of their Right. So actually a yeah. really good example of, of this person in, uh, in, in the structured agency is actually not a marketer. I don't know if she would want me to say her name, but it's our original project manager in the paid media department. Um, it's like a person who it's like, look, whatever role I put you in, I trust your brain. Yep. Right. Like, and I, I trust that you like know what you're doing. And that's what it is for you, Casey, is that it's like, I trust, you know what you're doing. I trust that you understand the core principles of what we do um, of digital marketing. So it's like, if I put you over here where, you know, maybe you're usually a shortstop, but I'm having you play third base or I'm having you play left field. Like I know, you know, the game. Right. And so, so you're going to be able to do it. And you know what you don't know, you know, when you need the help, right? Like that's yeah, you when know you, when you have, pull yeah. We need to pull the report. The one other personal add before we transition on those one is I think you need a, a head of head of content, head of design in house. Like you can't rely on uh, a, a freelancer or an outsourced team, whether it's a, an agency or just content creators to really own and know the brand or own the, like the value props that you want communicated. Cause sometimes they change. Sometimes there's a cadence of, of rotation or sometimes there's a, there's a pulse check of customer service that needs to be articulated through the content. And that isn't an agency, an agency yeah. or a freelancer. They they may or may they may not have the ability to go in and get that information, and then all of a sudden build things around it. You do need that nudge in the direction. Plus, you need someone to be like a little bit of the gut check of like, hey, tap the little little kick in the butt. Hey, come on, what, where's your ideas at? So I think yeah. I think it's always important to have someone that's got like your that's waving your banner when they come into these conversations. K Casey and I have a word for this, a, a title for this person, a working title for this person. It's the internal brand champion. Yep. Um, that's it. Right. And so they don't have to be a creative. They don't have to be, but it's like someone who's like, I'm actually just like super passionate about our customers. A lot of times they are one of the customers, like they are the target market. Um, and they're just like, I just know what's right. And, and sometimes us direct response marketers like butt heads with this person because we're like, but this will convert. And they're like, it's just not, it's not right for us. It's not right. Well, even you know? if and, but, but the best brands have them, the best brands have them. Right. Even if you do find yourself with a, in a partnership with a great agency, super competent, you know, they're killing it. They know how to generate the most revenue for your business. You know, that might not align with the future, the, the vision right. of the business. And that internal brand champion is kind of that connecting piece, kind of that glue you were talking about. Yeah. Some might be a separate person from that glue person you were referencing. But that kind of, I think that's a good segue into the next thing that, that I was wondering about is structuring things. You know, if you do only pay an agency based off of a percentage of what they make, of course, they're going to be incentivized just to make you as much revenue, you know, messaging or, or, or appearance be damned kind of thing. They're just going to look at the, the dollar signs. And similarly, if you only pay them a flat fee, then like, well, why are they incentivized at all to blow up your business for you? Yeah, right. Yeah, I have a lot. I have so many thoughts on this, but I've, <laughs> I've been able to like kind of formalize it in terms of like what's best for the, for the team. So you need the deal structure that is most mutually aligned towards the, the real success. Like you need the deal structure and I'll go specifics into my recommendations on this. A lot of the heavy lifting is going to be done in that first couple of months, especially if you're a brand new brand. A lot of the lifting is in, in, in tough times like we are in right now is going to be on the paid media team because they are the, the new source of revenue, right? 
So you want them to be thinking about you on the weekends. Like you never want to be the cheapest brand on an agency or the cheapest brand on a freelancer because you're most likely you're not going to get the extra little effort or it's going to be Friday at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. And you're probably not going to get that Slack response, right? Like there's that, that fine line of like, well, actually the extra effort that I'm putting in here is probably going to result in a better week next week, which means I could potentially accelerate spend or make a little bit more on that spend because we, I believe in you, you eat what you kill right? Like you are incentivized to grow the pie that you've been given. That percentage is negotiable, right? You can't have a, a projection. You can't have like a percentage of spend bonus towards your buyers or your growth team. And it actually ruins your margins. So we have, I mean, we have tons of calculators that make these decisions. We have a, a way to understand if you're truthful on your metrics and your numbers and the margins you need to grow, that season could be t- potentially different. There are times where a deal structure can change because you have to liquidate inventory. There are times targets may change because you are in a very defensive need profit now scenario. So it's actually not conducive for your partner of your growth to be spending a tremendous amount of money. There's a lot of different ways of going about this. So I, I think it is it is some sort of flat to make sure that there's something to hold has enough to cover their overhead. It's not egregious. I don't think it's egregious. And I don't feel comfortable throwing a, a plain number around because that does change depending on is it a team of six? Is it a team of four? Is it a team of three? But it should involve some sort of target at benchmarks of new levels of growth. If you came in at making 50,000 in rev and now their t- team is able to directly help you get to 75 to 100, that should be a compensation because they're going to want to continue to grow you. Yeah, yeah. So in, in, uh, I'm going to go a little more mindset on this because you went like very specific with that answer. So I'm going to go a little bit more mindset on this. And it, let, let me let me say it this way. If I'm a brand owner making a deal with an agency and let's talk about like just a paid media agency, right? Which is what we're talking about a lot of here in building paid media teams. Uh, but really, this is any agency. I, as a brand owner, what are my goals to grow my brand? Um, sometimes brand owners have goals. They don't actually know that those goals aren't realistic, but that's a whole other topic. Um, But like, what are my goals to grow my brand and how can I best structure an agency deal that's most aligned to that? Um, And, and there's two, there's two elements. There's a base fee and a variable comp section, right? So it's like, you know, typically with paid media agency deals, it's, it's this base plus this percentage of spend or this base or this percentage of spend. Let's just, you know, say, say that's what it is. Um, you think two ways as a brand owner. So first of all, think on the base side, I do not want this agency being cheap on me, right? So like if I want them to run Facebook, Google, you know, Pinterest, Snapchat, TikTok, I don't want to pay $500 a month for that because they're going to have like, you know, one person who's never run ads before in a third world country run in every single Make one the of margin. my accounts. And that's not going to... Yep, to make the margin and that's not going to crack this thing. You know what I mean? But you might be thinking, well, but look, I gave them this percentage of my revenue on the upside. And, and there are some teams that will go hard for that and are structured that way. But again, think about their margin. Like, think about what they're going to do. They're going to say, hey, if we can crack this quick, great. If we can't crack this quick, we're not going to pay attention to it. And that's just the sad yeah. truth. It's, of it. it's funny because we, um, we get this. And, and, we, we don't ask this enough. I'm sorry to interrupt you on this because that hit me. That, yeah. that made me yeah. remember this. The, my favorite questions founders ask me is like, do I get to talk to the team that's actually doing it? That's so many people don't ask this question because as us being so digitally focused, our company is hundred percent remote, right? Like we have studios and spots that yeah. you can kind of come work out, but every single person is on payroll. Like there's no freelance. So-and-so is going to pull in left or right. Like we have consultants that if we want to have them allow us to get more direction, or maybe we're not sure if we want to go in the, but we want to kind of consult some strategic thinkers. We have that, but there are so many brands that don't ask, like, do I get to have an inner like interaction with those who are actually doing the work on the account? Not people ask that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, it, it, that's exactly it. Right. So it's like, you know, if you want to go cheap on the base side, that's fine. If you really allow align the team on the upside of it, but understand that their mindset, like any team that is structured that way, where it's like, no, that's how we do our deals. It's pure performance, 100% performance. We've talked about this, Nick, like we kind of like really love this idea of being 100% performance, but at the end of the day, we're looking at it and like, we have overheads to hit. So if we were ever to do it that way, we'd essentially have to crack it quick 
or we'd have to kind of just let it be, yeah. you know, and, and just like not pay any attention to them. And that's not re- usually what a brand owner wants. Um, the flip side of it is, you know, some agency could say, hey, we charge you. I'm just going to, I'm throwing out ridiculous numbers on both ends of the spectrum. So $500 a month, huge upside or like, hey, no upside at all. Uh, but like, why don't I just pay them 50K a month, 100K a month just to run my Facebook ads and that will motivate them. Like not really, right? Like what motivates them? All they're really motivated to do is keep you as yeah, a Yeah, not lose you. Which right performance right which is great yeah I mean performance is part of that but if anytime anyone who's been in an agency knows that it's half performance half relation yeah that's my favorite right? thing it's you can it's it's two things it's a performance it's relation you can have strong performance and a relation can be terrible they'll stay you have a strong relationship performance can be kind of terrible they might stay but if you don't have both no way they're staying yeah well and 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 this is what I mean I I never want to be in a position. To not tell a client, like if the, if I know, hey, the best thing for you is to not work with us anymore. If that's the best thing for them, I never want to be in the position where I'm like, I don't feel like I can tell them that, right? And if you pay them some ridiculous high flat fee, that's all they're they're just gonna be yes man, right? Like they're just gonna it, they're and they're they're gonna care enough about performance, but if the performance isn't there, they're just gonna be like, how can I keep this brand, right? Like they're just gonna kind of keep running. Okay, we're gonna try this, and then we're gonna do this, and they're gonna put as little effort in they're, they're being efficient right they're going to put as little effort in as possible that it takes to keep you right and yes. maybe that's a lot of effort but like it's still as little as they can possibly put in they're not really trying to crack your business so yeah i mean the right balance is right and and uh, you know ultimately what i always say that you want is like you want a deal structure that covers their floor you know covers a covers an agency's floor but then motivates them to grow with you right like your ideal situation as a brand owner is an agency that has like you and no other clients and you send them big checks every month that cover their and you're happy about it and it doesn't eat into your margins that's your actual ideal situation now most brand owners don't actually want that and once they start sending their agencies big checks they think couldn't i hire this in-house um but you know we already covered that it's like yeah that doesn't really cover for your like down periods you know we we notice that if you if if you invoice a brand um, two times in a row for $25,000 or more, turmoil is coming. Like if you do three months back to back to back at 25,000 plus for just like the normal services of like a little bit of content, a little bit of paid, then you have trouble. And rightfully so. Like sometimes that's, that's not justified. Like how do you, how are you earning that? Mm-hmm. It, it, at very least, they'll often ask to renegotiate, right? And it's, they just become, you become a big line item as an agency. And I get it from a brand owner perspective. But understand that what you're doing as a brand owner is you're saying, hey, in order for you agency person to grow, I want you to have to go get more clients. Yep. Which people don't think about like that. They don't, right. they go, where's my time? Well, if we don't get the comp, we have to go find it to cover the comp because we both want to win. Yep. Yeah. So, so let's move. I think deal structuring on agencies, that's great. Uh, let's actually move to a similar topic, like deal structuring, but for in-house hires, right? So comp structures, if you are hired, let's, let's hit the people who maybe are hiring actual media buyers here, um, as well as the people who are hiring those key marketing roles that I spoke about a second ago. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I do always tell a brand like the most cost-effective way of making sure you're covering yourself is if you try to get them as in-house as possible, um, which oftentimes might mean you're going to get a junior mid-level. You're not probably not going to get a senior person unless they're able to manage multiple channels and a junior underneath them. And they maybe they're motivated by opportunity, but oftentimes it's going to be a percentage of your overall spend tied to like a, tied to your growth and revenue. They can be able to take a home, a percentage of that growth of revenue. Now it's not going to be a tremendous amount. It's probably going to be anywhere between about 0.5% to the max side 3% because that's one person managing multiple channels. Yes, it is a lot of your revenue. It is a lot of your direct directly attributed revenue to overall paid acquisition, but it's going to look like some sort of smaller base. And talking about California rates, it's probably around yeah. 50, 60, $75,000 for a, a head of growth. Um, no, I wouldn't say head of growth. I would say, really? I wouldn't say head of growth. I would say head of channel marketing. Like you're in charge of your main channels, Google, Facebook, uh, the big whales in the space. But if you're doing a head of growth, probably looking around like 120, 125 with upside in terms with of overall revenue. Comp. Yeah. Variable comp. That's, that is a nice variable comp. Here's what I have to say about this. The right types of people in these roles, they do want some security, um, yes. but they 
they want to kill what they're kill what they're kind of people, right? Like maybe they're not full on like door to door sales bros, but like one of the best media buyers I know, Van, was a door to door salesperson, right? And he loved it, and he's like, well, now I but I have a family now. Right. And so it's like that kind of people, right? Like the kind of people who invest in crypto, those are the best media buyers, the best head of growth, the the best performance marketers. Um, So they do want an element of kill what they eat. And oftentimes you're hiring them, you know, because they are those kill what you eat people, but they're like, yeah, I also need to like, make sure I'm taking care of, you know, I have a family, um, stuff like that. So those are the best kinds of people for those roles. So you do have to like give them some money for the in-houses, for the head of growths, um, for the brand champion type. Um, I would say, you know, uh, consider cap table if that's what you're, if that's what you're up to, maybe, you know, um, you know, you're going to lock them in. You're going to lock them in for at least the investment period. You're going to get at least four years with them. Um, and they're, they're going to be able to grow your departments, right? Like you're, you're, you don't want that person necessarily always clicking the buttons. You want them having an overview of like all the buttons that need to be clicked. Here's a good thing I would say about your in-housers is that you don't want them to be afraid of working themselves out of a job, right? Like you want them to actually be able to go on vacation for four weeks and everything runs smoothly and not be hiding stuff under their rug that only they can take care of. And when you put somebody into a job where it's like the main thing that they need to do is keep that job, uh, that's what they do. They make themselves indispensable, right? Like this is kind of like what people do. They kind of dig into a role. Um, whereas like, yeah, we talked about this as I was coming in before is that like, I don't want you to be afraid of working yourself out of this role. Cause then we're just going to use you elsewhere or you're, you are smart enough that you're going to see where you need to go next. Right. Yes. Um, so that, I think that's your in-house hires. Like that's really how you need to be structuring those things. Um, and yeah, like giving them, giving them a reason to stay, giving them a reason to really be passionate about like, you and your brand if they're media buyers specifically like if you're hiring media buyers specifically i think it is um yeah i mean another big part of it is like how can they grow as people and how can you keep them in a spot where it's like every media buyer ever who's good has thought you know hey i could go do this for myself and i would make more money so you know it has to be clear to them like why they're here and with you instead of going and doing it for themselves. And that's hard. That's even difficult for us. You know, I, oh, very. I, I have these conversations with media buyers all the time because they're go-getters, they're hustlers, you know? It's, it turns like, I would say more this year than anything, um, especially with you coming on, is like, it was easy to comp, it was easy to comp somebody on just dollars. It was so easy. Like, yeah, keep going. You're going to make this much. And then start turning like, well, I actually want to, like, I want opportunity in becoming a potential partner or, or I want opportunity in like leading a division that doesn't exist yet. Like you still have to co- allow that growth to happen. You still have to allow those opportunities when you're in-house, where else do you go? Like, yeah. unless you're building more people beneath you. So thinking ahead of what this person, what this role can turn into is something extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, there's three things that come to mind that like uh, our, our good friend of ours, James says, and, and he said, like one, you have to pi- find people's like non-money, non-monetary currency. Monetary currency is important and I don't want to downplay it. And I think a lot of times when people are like, create a culture that they love or like, you know, it's not all about money. What they're really saying is like, try and pay them less and like create a place that they really love. Don't do that, right? Yeah. Like, but once they are, once they're making more money than what, like what they need to live, uh, and this is the second thing he says, is he's like, like the human race is really strange because survival is kind of like more or less guaranteed for us, at least in first world countries, in the way that it wasn't, you know, hundreds of years ago, where it's like our main purpose was to survive. So it's like, we need this different purpose, right? So people have purpose, people have non-monetary currencies. Those are the things you need to find. And then different people are different. Like some people do want to lead a team. They do want to matter. Like some people are like, no, no, like I really love being like a technical executor. I love being like a a crafts person. Like I love working on my craft of, media buying or working on my craft of writing creative yep. like that, you know and so uh yeah you got to just consider all of that with these hires and and a lot of that isn't when you hire them that's like the ongoing conversations and like cultivating of like a, a place that they really want to be i think that's really well said um okay so we've got a couple minutes here left so one more thing that i have on hires right so specifically hires you're making if you're an agency if you're hiring in-house marketers if you're one of these people it's like marketing is my core competency i hire all this in-house um or if you know maybe it's not your core competency but you're just making those key hires and the key hires like i think well let's let's talk about it in each situation do you train these people 
like, what level of person do you get? Do you get someone who's like, no, no, they know how to do this job way better than I do. And uh, I'm getting out of their way. Or do you hire someone who's like, you know, no, they're going to need some training um, in different situations, which do you do? What level do you train them to? And, and, and especially people who do kind of know what they're doing. How much do you train them and say like, no, no, here's our system you need to run. And how much do you say like, have at it go. And this yeah. is, I think, big for us. And, and maybe this is just us kind of being a little bit masturbatory with our conversation uh, because this is big for us. Like we have really high level senior media buyers who really know what they're doing. And it's like, do we say, hey, here's our media buying system. You need to follow it. Or do we say like, no, nah, man, like here, here's some things I know. Here's some tools for your bag, but ultimately it's up to you, um, yeah. you know, or is it somewhere in between? This is, I love this topic. I think the easy thing to say is high, higher a, a plus play pool. Easiest thing is like hire A plus people all the time. That's the thing everyone says. Sometimes it's not available. Yeah. Sometimes you don't have the cash flow to get that. And they, they, the A plus people are going to demand a lower floor than a B plus, a C plus person. And like, just, just easily said, we want to hire as many A plus people as possible because it's not for myself or the company. It's for the people that they have to work with on a day-to-day basis. You want A players to look to your left and be like, that person has got me no problem. I'm ready to go. Mm-hmm. Not as easy to find. And they usually have a great place already. So unless there's some sort of turmoil coming in, you're most likely poaching these people. Yeah. Well, the more they're paid, the more they're compensated, the quicker they need to understand how your process works, right? So they need to prove themselves a little bit quicker than those that are maybe coming in at a lower cost rate. They don't have enough experience. They're probably going to get a longer run rate. Right, yep. so if you, the more you pay them, the quicker they need, they need to adapt your systems. The less you pay them, the longer time they have, because technically you have, you're not coming out of pocket too much, so you have a little bit more run rate there. Yeah, I yeah. do believe there's still whether they're overpaid, underpaid, A player, B player, C player, they still need an indoctrination period because they need to see how everybody else, what game plan they're all playing. Because you can't just jump into the system and all of a sudden be like, I'm gonna always run mine because A, it shows that you're not coachable, and B do you really want to be on an island or why did you join the, join a team in the first place? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This, I, I think I'm a good example of what you just said, right? Like me coming into structure. One of the early steps was you brought me in as a contractor to step into what you couldn't do anymore because it was getting too big. Right. right. And uh, you paid me kind of a lot, like more than anyone else you pay uh, because it, you were like, ultimately, John, I want you full time. So what does that take? And I was like, dude, yep. that's pretty tough for, you know, um, to take an entrepreneur and make them a full timer, right? Somewhere. We so, we so. we knew that we we knew that, or I knew that. This is me talking to to Schmitty. It was like this, this this investment in this individual was and is and it's proven to be the right decision because we knew that you needed a conversation, or else you'd have a wandering eye in terms of opportunities because you're an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur through and through. And you told me this left and right. Like I don't know what it is, but I'm going to continue to own something. I'm like do whatever you want. Just yeah. make sure that the mothership is happy. And that's kind of where we're at today, but right. it's overpaying those to let them know, like, I'm willing to commit to you. And here's the run. What, what tools do you need? Because you you need to hire the right person. That's willing to like speak up, right? Closed mouths don't get fed. Another one of my favorite things to continue to say is if you need something, you have to go ask for something. Cause if not, you're just going to kind of sit there and dwindle yourself. Yep. Yeah. And so it's like, and, and it was like, prove yourself quickly. The very first, at very first, I came and realized like, you guys don't have to say, you guys are running and gunning. That's the phase of business you're in. Right. And so it was like, Hey, Nick, get out of here. Do your thing. I got it. Right. Like yeah. it right away. That's, I realized like the reason they're paying me this is so that I can say, Hey, Nick, you hired me last week, this week, you don't have to worry about this anymore. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that's why it worked. We've hired other people that we kind of needed to do that. And, they weren't able to, like, they needed more training, more assist. How do you guys buy media? And we're like, no, 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 it's how you buy media. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I agree with that. And it, here's where I'm at with it right now. And I'll just, I'll just be transparent about it. We've gone back and forth all the time of like, Hey, do we have, let's say for an account structure for media buying, you know, for Facebook ads, for Google ads, do we have some core account structures we go to every time so that we can kind of like make that our proprietary thing where we say to clients like, Hey, here's what you're going to see in your ad account. Here's how we protect your dollars. Here's how we maximize your investment. And that's like, people love to hear that, you know, like Jordan has like a really strong, like account structure um, that he loves, you know, and that a lot of his people run and we're like, do we do this? Or do we kind of let the media buyers like, 
decide and uh and we go back and forth on this yeah maybe we should have some core ones but they can ultimately decide or maybe we should have some core ones and we really need to stick to those and where i'm at on this right now is that it's like okay what if we have pods right we have you know uh, a, a kind of marketing performance marketing manager you hate that title uh, right. performance marketing yeah. manager whatever we want to call them pod leader uh some senior media buyers within this pod and we kind of say hey pods you're your own business because that's how these people are they are entrepreneurial we say pods, you're your own business, just like someone who has their own business, you are going to get paid based on how that business does. Right. You can set up the operations of that little micro business, however you'd like. And I, as the head of performance, my job is to just say like, hey, here's some tools for your bag. Here's some training. Here's some training on uh, writing advertorials. Here's some training on uh, optimizing Google, right? Here's some- Very educational. It's, it's tools for your bag, take it or leave it. Hey, here's some ideas on how some operational structures you could use within your pods. Take it or leave it, your call. Hey, you're, hey it seems like you're struggling over here. Can I provide you insights? Can I step in and cover you? Yeah. I, Can I and, step in and cover you? Do you need any tools? Yeah. And we like that. We, we prefer, I prefer, and this is, uh, been a, I've been a very small teams, very large teams. The current team we have, I think is like the middle kind of like Goldilocks just right feeling. Yeah. Um, and there's enough, there's enough people that they can reach out to if they need it, but there's still not someone looking over their Slack channels going like, Hey, did you get that done? Because listen, you, you, you have to, you have to have enough like promise with yourself. You have to have enough commitment to like your word that you're going to get it done. Yeah, right. And like, yeah. that's on you. It all depends on your company's culture. Our company's culture is like, you, you know, killers kill, right? Like people, people who are hustlers and do well and are kind of, entrepreneurial do really well within structured and in order to like keep them in structured and, in, and not doing their own ventures we have to create an entrepreneurial environment where they get to eat what they kill exactly. um, and 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 vice versa when they don't kill they know right and so that and they're just not that kind of person so yeah i mean that's kind of like how we look at but like that wasn't how we did how i worked with casey at first like casey was raw and i've had a couple other people who are raw come in and, and kind of learn everything so I don't know. It's, you know, it's a judgment call. Yeah, I've got an interesting perspective on this because there's definitely a time and a place when you need that mercenary who is better than you at a certain skill and you wait for that A plus prospect and you hire them and, and you kind of let them run their system. Maybe when, when push comes to shove, if there's ever a, uh, you know, a moment of truth there, I guess. But with that raw person you're talking about, John, at one point that was me, you know, a few years ago. And I think there's a, a certain point where I really get what you guys are saying. I think it might help here. You gave me just enough leash, not to like, not, not enough rope to hang myself, but enough for there to be a little like touch of like, oh, I feel like I might've made a mistake that I want to self-correct. Yeah. You, you, uh, you know, you went down this thing and I asked you for, for your advice on something one day and you kind of put it back on me a little bit like, well, I never would have done the step before that that you did. That wouldn't have been what I recommended, but I wanted you to, to create your own path. And then you find yourself in a place where like, oh, I can't. I, I trailblaze a little too much and now I don't have a great source for, for help now. Right. And I might not want to trailblaze quite that much anymore. Maybe I want to steer myself down. What, what is your actual playbook a little bit more? I think if you can find those raw people who are trying to lean into your playbook more without just bugging you every five minutes, what should I do? What should I do? You know, right. there's some real value to those kinds of people. I, so I remember exactly. What sure. I remember exactly what you're talking about. You, we, the conversation and the exact thing I said was like, you were like, Hey, what should I do in this situation? Like, how should I make this read on this data and stuff like that? And I'm like, well, my guy, I would have never been in this situation. Cause I would have set it up like this. So I don't know what to tell you. And, and so like, I think it did two things It made you be like, okay, yeah. Like maybe I got a little too far off the beaten path there, but it also taught you some stuff. You, it taught you like in marketing, especially you need to always be able to reverse out of what you've done. Right. And it taught you that without me having to tell you it, because I could have told you it a million times and you never would have got it until you got into a situation where you couldn't reverse out and you couldn't rely on me to help you reverse out. So it's like, it was that. And then ultimately at that thing, that particular thing, it was, this was an email market in an email marketing play where we were looking at some data from a previous send deciding like, how aggressive do we go with this next send? Um, in, in that particular thing, you are now smarter than me at that. Right, because once I, I was like, you kind of leaned into my playbook more, but being the right kind of person that you are and me giving you enough leash, you know, hopefully I'm giving myself a little credit here, me giving you enough leash, 
you learned, you did those things, you made those mistakes. And ultimately you're like, yeah, your playbook's good. I love the core principles you taught me, but like, I'm more advanced at this now, right? Because right. I've, I've got more reps than you. I, I don't think you want to create clones of yourself. You want to create people right. who will be compliments to yourself. Exactly, exactly. And I, I, have a, I have a great example. I'm going through this right now with our head of content, right? He He's never built something to this size or generate this much revenue. But you, you look at him, you're like, Hey, I can, I can do it. I could do this. I've done this before. I know I can do this, but I can't, ha- I don't have the time or focus or that's not my, that's not where my, my brain needs to be at. You have to be at this level. So you, you have to let and remind everybody right now, it's not your reputation because you're not out on your own, right? You still have the umbrella that is structured umbrella that is John, Nick, chase jay like the faces in the area to kind of go like hey it's okay i'm gonna eat that i'm gonna feel that my shoulders are gonna be sore because i'm gonna have to carry a lot of weight but i need you to kind of kind of step up and get your get your uh get your reps in because it's not always going to be like that it's not always going to be as difficult or or as new for things because you're going to start earning those reps yeah when at one point you're going to have to sign your name to it then rather than my name one of the things casey said early on with me is that he was like I, and this was actually another team member we had. He's like, I don't trust this person to do this. And I was like, why? And he's like, I think if I ask them this question of like, are you ready to sign your name to this work or to this plan? They'd say, "Mm, yeah, maybe. What do you think? But if I said, are you ready to sign my name? Are you ready to sign John's name to it? They'd be like, yeah, yeah, totally. He's like, that's the wrong mindset. And that's why I don't trust them. Casey, like early on told me like, I don't like when I ask myself, am I ready to put my name on this? And I'm willing to take the responsibility for the outcome. Like, that's great. And a lot of times I am. But then when I say, am I willing to put John's name on this and John's snap on this? That's when I'm like, I need to revisit it. I need to make sure I've been thorough. Right. And so it's like, that's the kind of person. And that's the person that you're talking about. That's exact kind of person they are. So it's like, that's, I don't know, some maybe things around stringing people along and and helping them develop, you know. That's a great discussion. I think we could have a whole episode on that one. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're about out of time here, but like Nick, you've seen episodes, you know, as always, we're, we do a parting shot. Typically it's me when it's just me and Casey, but when I have a guest on, I do, you know, like to give you the parting shot. So we'll go to you and, and then give you final thoughts on this discussion today. Final thoughts, takeaways for brand owners, for freelancers, agency, really whatever you said, floor is yours, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, I love this. I love this. Thank you. Obviously, I am, again, number one fan of Modern Commerce. Um, w- the one and only fan. I, someone yeah, said that yeah, somewhere. Right. Yeah. Um, number one. You're the fan. You're the fan. I, I like Flight the of the fan. Concords. Yeah. I, having smart discussions with, with really smart people is kind of what, what I really enjoy the most. And um, it's been clear with having this with you and Casey that this is very smart people having smart conversations. Um, as an agency owner, as a brand owner, as someone as a freelance marketer, being open to having discussions that are extremely uncomfortable or things that you aren't 100% correct on, but feel feel a certain type of way about it without necessarily going through it. Like you can still feel in your heart based on other experiences, an opinion on that thing that someone's talking about. Don't be afraid to express that. Or like having an open place to have good dialogue or good thought partners or good thought work in general People don't have enough of it because they're afraid of what might come out. It might not sound as smart as they want it to be perceived as. And it's something that I think as you lean into more and more of these discussions that are recorded, more and more of these discussions that uh, people can reference back to, people are very cautious of what they say and how they say it. Get rid of that. Like I think it's, it's so unnecessary to think that the value of you or the words that you're saying are so important that somebody's like, take details and reference back to it. Man, you, I promise you, nobody even re- remembers the last ad they saw on their phone, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on, on IG or Instagram or Facebook. Um, that's my initial thought there. But the, for, for brands, for marketers, and for agencies, ask the questions that you really want to get answers to. Have you done this before? What is your comp structure? Where are your negotiations at? Feel comfortable in doing that. Nobody that has anything to hide should have anything uh, negative to say on this. And not enough questions are asked in that, in that frame of mind. Agency owners to brands ask questions around where they're doing, how, what's the, what do they see their outcome to be? Cause that's oftentimes very difficult to ask because you don't want to lose the deal or lose a contract, but it's more important than what you are doing because that business might go out of business, right? Like they, they might not be there, but your costs and your like actual like overhead is not super bad. You don't have too much to lose unless you have some proprietary thing that needs ongoing cost management. It's pretty much people that you have, right? So feel comfortable in asking those deep questions to, to the brand owners of like, where, what's your one year, five year, 10 year goal going to look like? And are you still going to be standing if anything happens like iOS 14? 
Beautiful. Yes, love the parting shot. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's it, Casey. What else, what do we gotta say all the YouTube stuff, like subscribe and stuff like that? <laughs> Guys, if you haven't already, go ahead, subscribe, like, comment, hit that bell icon so you get notifications on any of the, the new uh, videos that we drop on YouTube here. Uh, watch one of our other videos. And uh, until next time, we'll see ya.